Greetings and welcome to our last in the three-part series of Beyond Business. An expansion of the Tarnapol Lecture Series, Beyond Business is an ongoing conversation that explores the most complex and pressing issues impacting individuals and organizations across the world. This year's three-part series shines a light on how firms can improve on environmental, social, and governance criteria to drive positive change. Our first event in October focused on tackling the climate crisis. In November, we looked at how boards can redefine corporate governance to maximize a company's social impact while balancing the needs of all stakeholders. Today, our final event in this year's series will address the topic of humanizing ESG and how firms can be a positive force in addressing social challenges. I am thrilled to introduce two colleagues who are leaders in their field in this regard. My colleague at the Wharton School, Wiethold Heinz, Heinisch, I'm sorry, is a professor of management at Wharton. And joining us is Andrew Plepler, a global head of ESG at Bank of America. We hope to also be joined by John Struer, who is president and chief executive officer for Calvert Research and Management, a global leader in responsible investing. Before we get started, wanted to let you know that this will be a conversation that I will have the privilege of uh, facilitating between Veet and Andrew, and hopefully John. Uh, but we also want to engage the audience. So the first part of our time together will be me asking questions of the panelists, but then we will certainly have an opportunity to get audience engagement answer your questions. So feel free at any point in this session to submit questions using the chat feature and at the appropriate time, we will turn over to your questions uh, towards the end of the session. So with that, let's get started. And Veet, I'd like to start with you and have you sort of share with us the S in ESG, social. What does that mean from your standpoint and what groups or categories sort of fall into um, the links and how do, you, how do you tie those categories together? Thanks for the question, Erica. It's a really important place to start the conversation today. Uh, and as the title suggests, uh, you know, humanizing ESG, the S or the social factor is really about people, uh, people who are impacted by the firm and its operations. And, and those fall into three groups. Uh, first are a firm's employees. Uh, they're impacted by the level, the distribution of wages that a firm offers, uh, the health and safety benefits or safety conditions of the firm uh, operations. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion also falls under the S factor, as does training and development and, and even the broader corporate culture. Uh, the second group of people are the customers, uh, those who buy the company's products or services, and they're impacted by the quality and safety of those products and health implications of consuming them. They're also impacted by the way the firm sells, uh, the selling practices, the product labeling. Uh, they're impacted by the policies that guide uh, the protection of privacy and other customer data, as well as the extent to which they, they're really left over with any benefit, any surplus after they spend the money on buying the good or service. Did they feel good about the purchase or, or did every last cent and every last dollar get taken from them? And the final group, the third group is community members. Those who live beyond the fence, just outside the operations, the factories, the facilities, the offices, they need to be engaged by the company to discuss any grievances they have uh, on any issues and, and whether that process is one uh, that adheres to, to broad-based standards around human rights, around free prior and informed consent, and just generally shows respect uh, to treating them as good neighbors uh, is all really critical. Does I want to keep on this topic. Does it make sense to for companies to have to prioritize those categories of people or are they all equally weighted? How should we think about that? Uh, again, a great question. I think the, the answer depends a lot by company and by industry. Uh, in companies where they're really dependent upon their workforce, uh, where that's a really critical driver of value, uh, it, it's going to be more important to focus on uh, its employees, where uh, the physical location of their operations is one that might generate a lot of grievance because it's noisy or there's pollution uh, or, you know, they've, they've had challenges in the past about being a good neighbor. It, it may be more about community and access. Uh, to the locations, uh, and a, a company that's really driven by its brand uh, is going to focus more on its customers. So it's really about the salience of these different groups that's going to drive the allocation of resources by at the corporate level. That's that's helpful. Thank you, Andrew. I I know you have thoughts on on this. You have a significant role within Bank of America and focusing on the ESG uh, initiatives there. 
So let's dive deeper into the employee related issues. How do you approach those at Bank of America? Yeah, well, thank you, Erica. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I love how eloquent Vit just laid that out. I could uh, respond. Uh, he really hit on my how I spend my day um, with all of those constituencies. So uh, it was a good lens into what I do all day. Um, on the employee side in particular, uh, it is, uh, you know, I, every investor I meet with, uh, and I, I do one of the stakeholder groups that ESG now spends a lot of time with is investors. Um, and the first question they ask us all, almost always is about your workforce and how you treat your own people. Um, and it is becoming um, almost you don't get to the other issues of your ESG platform if you don't get past credibly uh, the how you treat your own people question. And, you know, for us, that's, you know, we've raised our minimum wage to uh, $21 on its way to $25. Um, you know, health benefits where we've kept premiums flat for our lowest paid associates uh, for the last eight years. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion metrics. And these things are incredibly important to all the outside stakeholders, stakeholders outside the company and to our own people. When you talked about, when you talk about attract and retain the best people, you are not going to do it today if you don't have a good answer to the question you just asked. And I, I, we spend an enormous amount of time focused on this at Bank of America both for altruistic reasons that we believe it's the right thing to do, but always also for very pragmatic reasons, um, which is, uh, you know, our employee SAT scores, <laughs> you know, to get technical corporate jargon a little bit here, um, but employee satisfaction is a real driver of success of companies these days. It's turnover, it's all, it affects all those issues. Um, and because we've spent so much time on this from the top of the house on down, um, our employee satisfaction scores have increased dramatically over the last five years or so. And I think it is not a coincidence. Um, it is through a lot of focus and attention. It's fascinating to see the evolution of companies in this work. And I'm curious from your experience at Bank of America, what the where the momentum has has come from? What's the source of, of the investment that you all are making in your people, for example? Is it from a top-down per perspective? Is it something that's bottom-up? Is it is it both? Well, I'd say it's both. Um, to give a cop-out answer, um, uh, that both, uh, Brian Moynihan has been, he's chaired our Global Diversity and Inclusion Council since as long as I've been here. Um, you know, what for at least since he's been before he was CEO, which was 10 years ago. Um, so there's an enormous focus on it from the top. Um, and I would say that has generated a lot of attention, um, a lot of awareness, visibility. Um, but I think societal issues um, have have just awakened um, almost a movement amongst employees um, that they want their company um, to address societal challenges. And so it's not just anymore, what do your diversity and inclusion numbers look like? And are you making progress in representation? But it's, are you playing a role in society that's meaningful and important? Because if I'm going to spend 10 hours a day um, I want to do it at a place that shares my values and shares my concern about the issues that we face as a, as a country. And I think that that has driven enormous focus on, you know, D&I inside the company, but also to, to, to Vitt's point, um, issues outside the four walls of the company. Yeah, absolutely. So Vid, I'm gonna come back to you because in the initial question you had mentioned that it's not only about employees, but it's also customers. So what customer impacts are most relevant 
Well, the most obvious ones that we talk about from an ESG perspective relate to public health. I mean, one of the first industries that uh, you can think about that was really criticized and, and uh, confronted with some ESG challenges was the tobacco industry because its products were killing people. Uh, and uh, but that goes beyond, uh, you know, it goes beyond tobacco. Uh, we think about uh, sugar today and obesity. Uh, and so you bring the whole agribusiness sector in and start having conversations around the impacts on public health. What are people consuming? Uh, and now, uh, you know, the Facebook whistleblower, Francis Hougens, has called attention to the tech industry and, and some of the public health impacts and, and depression uh, that can accrue to uh, online, uh, you know, the number of hours we spend online. Uh, but beyond that, you know, it's I think there are other issues that are coming into the fore. You know, we're talking more and more about data security, data privacy. And I think this broader question of uh, to what extent uh, customers really benefit from the product and how much are they left over with after they consume it, you know, contrasts, say, uh, technology that brings financial inclusion uh, uh, and, and the access to banking, the access to loans, uh, the ability to bring that out into new population, everything that that can leverage and, and contrast that with the technology that you know generates likes or clicks or clickbait. Uh, you know, consumers may be consuming both, but one of them is leaving them a lot better off. And, and are we recognizing that and thinking about that and incorporating that within our ESG investment strategies? And I think, you know, on the community side, um, you know, I think there, there are a number of important issues in terms of ES, which, uh, which community actors do companies uh, deal with and interact with. And, and we really need to look outside the fence, look outside the doors of our office and understand who our neighbors are. Uh, and like with the customers, the answer is going to depend so much by firm, by industry. Uh, but you need to go through that process of identifying what's important to your neighbors, who represents them, who has good standing and who has good status with them, and start opening up the door to conversations with them to make sure you're a good neighbor. And so in, in both places, there's a lot of heterogeneity, but there's some really simple common principles to start with. Excellent, thank you. And I, I see that John Struer has, has joined us and uh, welcome John, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, we are just in the early stages of the conversation, so I'm going to give some context for you before I, before I ask a question, uh, but get ready because we're coming to you. <laughs> so I want to move now to the focus on uh, what you've already, both of you have already mentioned, which is very prominent uh, changes that have been happening in society. One around health related matters, one certainly around climate matters, but also you know, 2020 was a wake up year in terms of matters connected to racial injustice. And so Andrew, let me start with you. How has the recent unrest surrounding racial injustice affected the agenda priorities at Bank of America? Well, I think most companies, um, you know, you would be pretty tone deaf um, if, if you didn't uh, sort of absorb what we lived through in 2020, both through the pandemic and through the social unrest and, and social injustice issues that we confronted. Um, and we were no different. So as a technical matter, we launched a $1.25 billion initiative around racial equality and economic opportunity. I would say that that's just the beginning. Um, it's a substantial financial commitment to address health, jobs, small business, housing, some of the issues we've mentioned. But more importantly, it was the tone that was set by that, which is these issues are not separate from what we do all day. I mean, uh, Vit just mentioned, you know, financial inclusion, financial access, lending, um, products and services. Um, I think it was an awakening to examine all of that. Uh, you know, both what can we do philanthropically, what can we do with resources, but what do we do also with, you know, our core business um, and how we serve communities um, to address not just the health impacts, but some of the root causes of why there's social unrest and why there's anxiety. Um, and it's you know largely attributed to many issues of systemic racism and inequality, and there are things we can do. Um, and in I think this was an opportunity for us to do that kind of examination, um, and and decide and determine where we could intervene, and be helpful. And I would be remiss if I didn't also say um, that we have facilitated an enormous amount of dialogue inside our company. 
people were uneasy. There was tension. There was, um, you know, friction. Um, and we've launched a program that we called Courageous Conversations. Um, I think we've done about 350 of those where we've brought external civil rights leaders, external community leaders to really talk through these issues of um, police community relationships, inequality, um, you know, uh, uh, racial understanding, why people are so upset about schools and curriculum. Um, and I think it's important that you give people an opportunity inside our companies to talk through these issues in what will hopefully be a, a civilized um, setting uh, and not a food fight. And sometimes that's more successful than others, but I think it's important that we undertake the, the work. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So John, I wanna ask you a question connected to this. In June of 2020, you made what might be seen as a provocative statement. You said, ending racism in America is a responsibility of corporations. What can be done to encourage action on this front? What should companies be doing? I want to address what we did and, and what our position is at Calvert. Um, and first of all, Calvert is a very diverse firm. We're about 50% women and 50% people of color at Calvert. We manage $40 billion across global capital markets. And we think about this issue extensively from an investor's perspective. Um, and um, the reason I made the statement I made is that we think that racism and companies' ineptitude in terms of dealing with uh, DEI well is hurting value, is destroying value for shareholders. Uh, we have the empirical evidence to show that, and we've built the business case around the need for corporations in the United States to do a better job creating an environment, to create an attractive workplace for women and people of color to do their great work. And that is what we want to correct for. We want, uh, and, and we invest in most companies. Um, you know, we own positions in over 4,000 companies worldwide. The problem in the United States is unique. Uh, and the need in the United States is unique. The demographics of the country are changing, as you pointed out. The educational attainment uh, rate of change for educational attainment amongst minorities and women is off the charts in a positive direction, significantly outperforming their Caucasian cohorts across the board. So as an investor, we look at change and we look at risk. And so we see uh, a need that our society has for skilled labor. We see the changes in educational attainment amongst women and minorities. We see what's happening in the workplace, and we know that the companies that we've invested in are not doing a very good job creating an environment to be able to attract the talent of the future, the people who will have the advanced degrees, be able to work in the digital economy. Increasingly, that is a diverse workforce. So we build the business case, show the educational attainment, build the financial case, and then um, we know that we have a problem with our companies. They're not disclosing to us their policies or the demographics of their workplace. Uh, so we launched an activist campaign um, with, uh, we, we went um, to the 100 largest companies uh, in the US, uh, 85 of them were refusing to disclose their human capital data, the so-called EEO-1 report. Um, and so we began uh, to engage with these uh, CEOs and uh, independent chairs mostly. Um, in most cases, it was men um, to compel them to release that information and begin to create the transparency that we needed as investors to really understand the risk that we had with these companies who were failing on diversity. And it was most of them. That campaign has resulted in 70 additional companies uh, disclosing this data and significant, I think, changes. And we're coming at it from a perspective of trying to improve value for shareholders while helping companies solve this problem associated with their inability to create this attractive career pathing and workplace, uh, particularly for mid-career employees. 
Uh, that's our approach at Calvert. We see the issue, we see the problem, we build the business case, uh, we take action. I think we filed 17 shareholder resolutions, um, only two of which went to a proxy fight. The Tesla vote came in about three weeks ago, which we won. Um, so it's been a typical Calvert approach, right? We see the problem, the opportunity, build the business case, take it to the boards, try to create more transparency, create the kind of change that will help people, but it's also consistent with our role as an, as an investor. We're trying to de-risk these companies. We also built a factor, a diversity, equity, and inclusion factor and launched a DEI index that now has a couple hundred million dollars in it uh, from investors. So those are the things that, that we did after I made that statement. Thank you for the detail and I'm, I'm curious, uh, Andrew, I could see you thinking a lot and processing uh, what John has been saying. I'm wondering if you have any reaction or response or want to comment on, on his remarks. No, I was taking down some notes, though, um, that I will certainly follow up on. Uh, you know, I think John makes some great points. I mean, we just released a human capital management report that I think has a lot of the data John is looking for. Um, you do. I agree with that. Um, which, uh, you know, so we're, we're uh, and I would agree with him that, that progress has been incremental in this space um, and, and not fast enough. And, um, you know, we have done, I think on the, on the DNI disclosure, we've paid a lot of attention and I think it's important. I couldn't agree more with them. And I totally agree with them on the business case um, where we have our own data from our uh, research and uh, team uh that absolutely validates what john is saying about uh the the business case for both transparency but also substantively making progress on these issues yeah so let's shift gears a little bit because not only in recent years have we seen uh, much more focus on racial and social justice matters but we also have all been affected by the pandemic so Veet, let me bring you in. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic raised companies' awareness of their strengths and weaknesses in dealing with social factors such as the workforce? So, you know, COVID has magnified a lot of stress uh, felt by employees. Uh, it's really been a you know, stress multiplier. You know, it's accentuated inequality. Uh, some people have been able to work from home, haven't had their income affected. Uh, it's accentuated inequality and in worker safety and worker health. Some people have to go to work and, and the frontline workers, but, but also many others uh, who, who don't face a choice as to how safe to be, uh, but have to make a choice between um, maintaining their job, maintaining their income and, and putting themselves at risk. Um, it's also uh, given employees more sense of whether their employers live up to the talk. Um, you know, many firms signed up to the business roundtable resolution, uh, supporting a broader perspective on the purpose of the organization. Many employee employers talk about the importance of employees and how important their workforce is. But then what did they do during COVID? Uh, how did they respond uh, to the stress their workforce was under? Uh, did they walk the walk or, or did they just sign up and talk but not deliver uh, to their workers in this difficult time? As we emerge from the COVID crisis, I think workers are going to remember. Uh, we're seeing many workers reassess their commitments to their employers and the tolerability of those working conditions. Uh, I would imagine that the employers who stood by their workforce in the time of stress and the time of crisis are going to experience less attrition, greater ability to recruit new workers, more engagement, more productivity, a more positive relationship uh, because those employees felt they had a partner to rely upon uh, during the COVID crisis. I think employers who were less, um, who took a more transactional approach, who really focused on the short term consequences uh, may face a very different set of uh, employee relations going forward. Uh, so I think it was a stress multiplier that also revealed uh, what firms were about, what they stood for and how they acted in a tough time. And I expect employees to remember that going forward. Yeah, as as a leader of an organization myself, I am very much in the throes of living uh, what you have described and, and uh, grappling with the same issues and, and seeing the labor force change substantially and a growing sense of inequality that exists between those who have the option to make choices and, and those who, who less so. So Andrew, the pandemic has heightened pre-existing uh, trends toward 
income inequality. Is this something that companies like Bank of America should be focusing on and, and trying to address? Absolutely. I mean, the you know, some of this data coming out recently is uh, a little alarming about the loss of educational achievement through the pandemic, um, disproportionately felt in lower income communities with less access to broadband. I mean, no surprise, um, less access to continue to their education virtually. So we are further apart um, in terms of achievement gap. Um, achievement gap is wider than it was pre-pandemic. And that's going to affect uh, an enormous amount of hiring and um, finding uh, qualified workers to fill really important jobs. So we are looking at that data and some of the partners in our community that we can work with to try and uh, minimize the effect of that learning gap because it's... Um, I think for the next five years uh, and potentially beyond is going to be something we're really playing catch up on. Yeah. So John, from your perspective, how has the pandemic increased the focus on social matters for investors? Well, I think uh, your first question also, uh, if I uh, could, culture and human capital management. I think you know those two aspects of um, what a corporation is and how a corporation works, um, you know, have been found, I think, over the course of the pandemic um, to be uh, significantly undervalued. And I think as we come back from, the, as companies are coming back from the pandemic, um, the companies that had you know, very strong culture very strong human capital management. And frankly, those companies often had you know, very strong performance across the entire spectrum of ESG factors. Um, we can see a big difference in how those companies are coming back from the pandemic versus companies who were weak in those areas coming into the pandemic. And I think that from an investor's point of view, from a corporate finance point of view, uh, one, of the, one of the learnings that's gonna come out of the pandemic is the role of culture in understanding kind of corporate finance and firm. And I think it's going to take the principal agent theory, um, you know, to task, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think, I think a so, lot of learning happened during the pandemic uh, from, from every perspective and culture and uh, human capital management, I think, will be uh, areas of significant focus for researchers and corporate finance people, um, academics going forward as a result of what we learned here. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience that if you have questions about anything that we've talked about so far, feel free to include those in the chat and we'll be coming to those questions shortly. So Veet, back to you. Um, your research links social factors to risks for mining companies infrastructure projects, and municipal finance. Can you summarize some of the main findings that would, would help us better understand what it is you do in this field academically of ESG? It's always a daunting task to try to summarize 10 or 15 years of research in two or three minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, look, what I've, what I've tried to do, we, we've all talked about the how we believe these issues to be material and we see evidence that they're material. But it's really challenging. I mean, we don't have good data on uh, income inequality across uh, deciles of uh, employees uh, by uh, by wages. We don't have good data on what stakeholders think of companies. And, and then linking it to financial performance, you know, there are uncertain lags. It takes two, three years. So how do we build an empirical case? That's what I've tried to do over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, a series of studies looked at gold mining companies, which were single purpose entities. And it was really helpful because they were they were publicly traded companies, but they only owned one asset, a gold mine. And for disclosure standards on the Toronto Stock Exchange, they had to basically reveal their cost function. What's the fixed cost? What's the marginal cost of operating the mine? So we could figure out what the value of the company was based on the gold it had the legal rights to. But we found a lot of these companies traded at a massive discount to what the resource value was. And then we coded stakeholder opinions of the firms from the media. What did people say about the mine? Did they act on the mine in a way that was cooperative or conflictual? 
And we showed that you could explain the variation in the stock price of these mining companies by looking at whether stakeholders supported the mine or not. And then we could show that the companies that were more inclusive, more participatory, engaged sooner with more stakeholders and addressed their issues of concern, all benefited both in terms of stakeholder support and in terms of stock market valuation. Uh, with John's and the Calvert Institute's support, we tried to extend some of this logic into municipal finance. Can we build a case that addressing racial justice and addressing environmental justice for a municipality or a county actually pays? It's not a cost. It's not something they're doing because of social justice. They're also doing it because it improves the fiscal health and fiscal strength of the county and the community over a three to five year time horizon. There'll be more businesses, more taxpayers, higher income, if we can address some of these issues and eliminate or mitigate uh, some of the negative consequences of racial and environmental injustice. So throughout the body of work, it's been finding ways of bringing data to bear to help make this business case. Uh, and convince people that ESG isn't about ideology, it's about economics, because then we get many more people on board than trying to fight ideological battles. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. Uh, John, there's been a push to conduct more human rights due diligence on investment projects. What's your state, what, what's your belief in the status of that work and how much success have they had? Well, I think um, just broadly, the, you know, the issue of uh, human rights uh, for investors uh, is uh, is extremely important, and we're going to probably face in 2022 uh, an environment that will be uh, calling on investors to take uh, much more action, whether it's in China or in Sudan or in other parts of the world where we simply have weak governance. Uh, we have natural resources that the developed world wants. And uh, we have a recipe for human rights uh, violations. And uh, um, investors are going to be increasingly called upon as a result of new regulatory frameworks in the EU and coming in the US uh, to be able to take steps to verify that they've done their due diligence in their research. Uh, on the companies that they've invested in regarding their human rights policies and procedures. All of these are being strengthened. It's a pretty good story uh, in terms of the direction of travel um, and the progress being made. Uh, it's an area where I think investors you know, have made a significant contribution. Uh, for instance, Calvert itself helped draft uh, Dodd-Frank 1504, which deals with conflict minerals. Um, and a, uh, an issue that's become you know, extremely relevant again today uh, with the uh, electrification uh, move and the need uh, for some of these minerals in um, renewable energy uh, infrastructure. So I think this is, is a very significant issue. Um, it's going to become a, a, probably a, a, a larger factor in 2022. Um, and it's an interplay between human rights and the energy transition uh, that I think is something that we're going to hear a lot about in 2022. In other words, the respect uh, for the rights of the people for whom uh, renewable energy is not currently an economically viable option and whether or not we adequately consider you know, the needs of those people in this energy transition. So I think that will be yet another application of this concept of, of human rights and business activity. Yeah. So Andrew, you could argue that Bank of America is sort of a standout company in some, terms of some of the actions that you all have been making and the commitments under your leadership to suspend lending to private prisons and gun manufacturers, as well as you know, the, the outlay of $1.25 billion over the next five years to combat racial inequality. What led to those decisions and what are you already starting to see with those investments and what more do you hope to see over the next several years? Well, I would separate the two. The 1.25 billion did come on the heels of the disparate impact of the pandemic and, and the and the police killings of 2020, um, and you know, and and that was sort of a moment in time response to sort of put a stake in the ground to say we are going to address these sort of systemic issues of racial equality and, and lack of opportunity 
uh, in these communities and very consciously not making it a point in time one year and we're done. Um, that was sort of the point of saying, look, at the very least, this is five years. This is going to have to be a sustainable effort over time. Those other social issues that you mentioned, private prisons, guns, um, uh, what John was saying with uh, oil and gas, um, these are issues fraught with complexity inside our companies, certainly financial institutions. And I think it's important to say this, which is, um, there is not a monolithic point of view of the right answer on these questions. Um, these are heavily debated. Um, we have customers and clients um, with a, a very diverse set of viewpoints, to say the least. Um, and you could look at my email box to, to just get a reflection of, uh, of society at large. Um, and I think these are tough. These are tough calls for corporations. I mean, we have a set of principles. I mean, I could go into excruciating detail. I'll spare you of the um, journey on exiting private prisons um, and exiting gun manufacturers. Um, but you would be astonished at some of the reaction to those decisions. Um, and I think we felt they were right for our company. We were. Uh, responding to our own employees, to the impact that these issues had in communities where we live and work. Um, so we tried to make it about um, not ideology, as Vitz said earlier, but as to how we think about our obligation to society and how we manage risk. Um, these were uh, issues that were becoming a distraction for both for the company. Um, and we made, we landed on the side of those issues that we felt reflected our values and reflected our uh, uh, assessment, our comprehensive approach to risk management. And, but it isn't without, uh, it isn't for the faint of heart. I think it's important to say um, every one of these decisions inside companies as large as our, ours, um, does have an action and reaction. Um, and not everybody that we serve um, across the country agrees with every decision we make on these issues. Um, and, and it makes it complicated. So how do you manage the folks who come out on a different, with a different opinion <laughs> or set of values than, than what you have espoused as Bank of America's values? Yeah, I mean, look, I love to sit down and talk to stakeholders, those who agree with us and those who disagree with us. Some of those conversations are constructive. Unfortunately, not all of them are. Um, I think the best you can do is sort of explain that we are not, um, we are not making a political statement in decisions we make. Um, this is how we go about making decisions that may be controversial. Um, we look to our employees, we look to our other stakeholders, we look to the principles laid out in our environmental and social risk framework, and we have a pretty methodical approach with um, people of diverse uh, political perspectives engaged in the decision-making process. And hopefully we land um, in a place that is in the best interest of our company uh, and our communities and the people who work here. And we try and talk to the other, uh, whoever disagrees with whatever decision we make, we try and engage in a dialogue to say, look, this is how we think about these things. Um, we respect that you disagree with us. Um, but this is, uh, we're not trying to hide. We make decisions, we declare them, and we move on. Um, and I think today you can't hide. You have to make the decisions and you have to be prepared to defend them. Thank you. So we're gonna move to audience Q&A in just a moment, but this is a question for all three of you to answer briefly. What, what, what assurances do you think exist that progress will continue on the ESG front going forward. Let me start off John, if I could. I'll start with you. Um, sure. You know, we are, we are uh, in the United States, 
I think we would answer that one way. And we might answer that a little bit differently for Europe. And then globally, I think we could answer that a third way. And it is because of the role of our, of our regulator, of the government. Yeah, I think one important point uh, to, to introduce here is the concept of in the, in the US, and I think to a degree in the EU, um, we're getting what we think of as the voluntary market-led solution, market-based solution. Um, and so the guarantee that progress is going to be made is, is only available to those who trust in the power of the market, because the government is really not doing uh, what we thought it might do, by the way, either in the pandemic uh, or on climate change. COP26 is just a great example of that, or on a host of social issues. Uh, so we don't have a guarantee. And frankly, most people, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this based on data, most people would say they don't trust the government to help get us to where we need to be. Uh, so we have no guarantees. Uh, and we are really trusting a voluntary market-led solution uh, more in the U.S. for sure, a little less in the EU. That's their habit. And uh, certain parts of Asia uh, have a whole different approach to trying to deal with this. Um, so I, I think what you know, a, a way of putting it back is um, in the United States, um, are we comfortable with the market-based solution that we're getting? And if not, investors need to get engaged um, and take action and send the right market signals. Um, and take action in terms of how they allocate capital. I think that's really the only guarantee that we have. We could talk a lot about additional data, transparency, the potential for regulation, et cetera, but it's all going to add up to a voluntary market-led solution. So, Vete, what would you add to John's remarks? Well, I, I agree with the idea that we're following a voluntary market-led solution. I, I think data is really paramount then because we need to convince people. And then who do we need to convince? Well, we're, we're doing a, a reasonable job on the investor front, I, I mean, as evidenced uh, by my co-panelists, uh, but there are other stakeholders that can pressure companies. And we've talked a little bit about employees already, uh, but what about the creditors? What about the financiers, the people issuing debt? Uh, they could be more engaged in this. And what about the insurance companies? I think there's a host of other pressure groups uh, that if we that we could better engage uh, with the evidence, with the data, and and have them join the campaign for more attention to the S factor. Thanks, Andrew. You get the last word before we move to I, audience Q and A. I probably can't say it better than than my two previous uh, panelists said it. I think that stakeholder capitalism is is going to uh, ensure that this is a front and center issue. I think that's investors, that's employees. That's uh, uh, community groups. We have a very active shareholder engagement uh, program with investors, and we have a very active National Community Advisory Council, which is consumer groups, environmental advocates, civil rights leaders, that is now core to how Brian runs our company. Um, and these are no longer fringe activities that um, I do, or someone in, uh, who will succeed me in this role, does off the si off to the side of our company. Um, it is now core to how the company is run, and I think that ensures that this will be um, critical to the success of the company for the foreseeable future. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Let's hear what our audience has to, what they're curious about. So, Vit, the first question is for you. Uh, it says, while there is some consensus on how to measure environmental impact, we don't have measures for social factors. What sort of measures do you feel firms and investors should be tracking? Well, I think John started us out with a, a big one that's coming forward is uh, more disclosure of wages uh, across the distribution of employees, not just comparing the executives to the median, which we've been able to do for many companies for a while. Uh, but what about the 10th percentile, the 30th percentile, the 40th percentile? Let's let's disclose that data uh, and let's be able to look at the full wage distribution by companies. 
Uh, let's have more transparency about lawsuits. Uh, who's filing, you know, which workers are filing suits against their companies, which customers, which communities. Uh, that's certainly an indicator of grievance. Uh, and let's pay more attention to stakeholders' opinions uh, that we can glean from social media, from media, uh, from other factors. Let's bring all that to bear and understand what issues are of concern to them and look at whether the companies and their stakeholders are talking about the same uh, work. I'm a little biased. This is the work we're doing at the ESG Analytics Lab is, is trying to do this, connect these dots. Uh, but I'm optimistic that we can make real progress. Yeah, I'm optimistic also. Uh, John, question for you. How can businesses change their practices with partners to better, to better meet ESG goals across the supply chain? Um, the partners, I think, might be NGOs in this case uh, that the, that the uh, individual may have in mind. Um, and there are uh, over 10 million NGOs in the world today. And many of them uh, you know, have involvement in supply chain issues. Uh, so I think that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, many companies who are serious about addressing uh, supply chain issues, uh, seek knowledge and work with uh, NGOs who have on the ground local knowledge uh, in efforts to try to improve situations and improve conditions. Uh, another set of issues, I'm not sure if this was on the questioner's mind, um, but you know, at this moment today, uh, the issue on supply chains, in addition to uh, human rights and safety of the workers and you know, environmental stewardship through the supply chain, um, is simply the logistics of ensuring the supply chain. Um, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is probably the crisis event that we needed in order to get the focus required onto this particular issue, because so many of the externalities uh, have, been, have been outsourced to, quote unquote, the supply chain. Um, and so really being able to uh, address that is, is paramount. Right now, the supply chain has generally been treated as a place to save money, right? Use the supply chain to find places to cut costs. But the, the uh, quality of the supply chain um, is going to come into much sharper focus. In addition to the NGOs that can help solve kind of human rights issues and, and other issues on the ground associated with sustainability, um, there's, there's a global audit system that deals with supply chains. So another partnering uh, opportunity for smaller companies that need to deal with supply chain issues and assure quality is for them to engage with third party uh, audit firms, uh, some of whom kind of can help understand issues in the supply chain. Um, Vet, I think you may have something to add there. On supply chain, no. I mean, I think you you covered it really well. I think the uh, the opportunity for partnerships, the need for transparency. Um, and, and really thinking beyond just the operations of the firm. I mean, I agree with you. We need to look in the value chain. I think a lot of the S issues aren't under the direct control of the company. They're who we're sourcing from, uh, but we can have enormous impact uh, on that entire supply chain, uh, especially large consumers, um, because their stakeholders care more. And, and so that's the right pathway to affect change uh, back further up in the supply chain. So, no, totally in accord. This has been a, nobody asked me, but I'll talk anyway. The uh, the this has been an enormous issue for us. I mean, when we talk about net zero uh, on the E side of this, um, it's it's in our financed emissions, but it's also in our supply chain. So we're getting um, all of our suppliers. Um, you know, I don't think we've imposed yet a net zero commitment on all suppliers, but it's headed in that direction. Um, and they're certainly ha being asked to answer the questions around emissions. And then same on the S. I mean, our supplier diversity efforts um, is a huge economic engine. Uh, we spend $2 billion a year on diverse suppliers. Um, that can create a lot of jobs. So it's it's a enormous focus and, and there's huge opportunity there. I'm glad that you added that. Uh, and Andrew, I'm going to stick with you actually, because another question has come in for you that is following up on the notion of transparency. So the questioner asks, what would you say are the best practices for DEI transparency by companies? 
Well, I think John's the one that should, uh, John is the expert here. Um, I look, I think the EEO data, I think, um, I, th I think, uh, uh, Vit is absolutely right that, that some of these, my, my HR partners inside the company will probably kill me for saying this, but, um, you know, more data around wage disparities inside of companies, I think is vitally important. Now there are complexities to that. So I want to be, um, you know, we've looked at these issues and hard to get like jobs, like pay for like jobs. There are particularly in large companies like ours, and then people misinterpret the data. Um, and then you're in a whole nother fight. Um, and so it can get, I understand from an HR perspective, why these issues are sensitive, but I think the spirit of the point of, we want more data. We want to understand whether you're treating your people well, whether you're paying them well, and whether you're uh, not uh, the defendant in a you know unsettling number of uh, lawsuits uh, on on labor issues, I think are all legitimate questions. I think how we get that data out. Um, can be a little more complicated. We need to give more thought to it. John, is there anything you would add to that? Well, I think um, uh, there are certain policies um, that uh, we would like companies to provide you know, transparency to uh, in, in human capital management that relate to DEI. Um, some companies do, some companies don't. So the, the way I would address this question is to say that the SEC, in fact, is addressing this question. Um, and they're, they're addressing two major questions right now. They're addressing a question of what should companies disclose regarding climate and what should companies disclose regarding human capital. And on the human capital disclosure, there's a, a set of issues related to DEI. So the numbers are one thing getting that EEO one, and thank you, Michael, I appreciate that. Um, but getting, understanding how well a company is creating uh, a, uh, an environment uh, to, to create access to opportunity. Because you asked a question early on about inequality. And one of the things that we know about inequality is a root cause is the denial of access to opportunity that occurs in the United States. And so companies have a role to play there uh, through training, through development, through educational opportunities for their whole workforce. So in addition to the numbers, we want to understand the policies and understand how well the company can create that environment uh, for you know, everybody to be successful, but particularly training, education, development opportunities for women and, and people of color. So we want to see those policies. I just add one more point here. It also trees into culture. Uh, you know, a, a company's ability to create an attractive environment for a diverse workforce tells you a lot about that company's culture. Uh, and I think there's a, a marker you can pick up on culture is related to, believe it or not, maternity leave. One of the things in the United States is we don't have uh, good government policies on paid maternity leave. So we've totally delegated that critical aspect of our entire society to corporations, and they all have different policies. We want to see those because they tell us a lot about the culture, and there's a correlation between how well companies create the, these longer standing policies for women and the kind of environment they've been able to create for, uh, uh, for, for a, a completely diverse workforce. So a number of pieces of information that we would like to see. Uh, if you want to contribute to this, the SEC will still read comments that are sent into it regarding um, these disclosures. Well, every question that I've posed or that the audience has posed has sparked more questions. So I know we could all stay in, in, in dialogue on these topics for quite some time, but our time has come to an end. And I want to thank my colleagues, Viet and John and Andrew for joining us. Your remarks were compelling and uh, thoughtful. So I hope that the audience enjoyed this engagement. 
Speaking of audience, I want to thank our audience for participating in this year's Beyond Business series. We look forward to seeing you next year for another series of conversations on the most complex and pressing issues impacting you and your organizations. Thank you all.